Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just going to share my screen with you. That way you can view the slides. Give me just one moment. Okay, so thank you again for joining us this morning and thank you Gladys for, for the introduction and for the opportunity um, you've given us to share this information with you. As Gladys mentioned, my name is Javier. Uh, I am a psychologist working with the Florida State University College of Medicine and Kathy is also here with me today. Um, my specialty as a psychologist is working with children. Um, I work in a pediatric integrated care setting and I'll talk a little bit today about what integrated care is about and the type of services that we provide. Um, I'll share a little bit about our community as well, but first I, I wanna give Kathy also an opportunity to introduce herself and welcome you this morning. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm really very happy to be able to be here, um, share with Dr. Rosado and with all of you. Um, as you know, my name is Kathy DeVito. Uh, I'm a teacher by profession and also um, spent most of my adult life in Latin America as a missionary. I came back uh, 2016 and Florida State University. I feel blessed that I got found <laughs> by Florida State. So I have the opportunity to work alongside Dr. Rosado and uh, the people here in Immokalee. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Uh, so Kathy does a variety of things uh, with us at the Florida State University College of Medicine, but it, as part of her work, uh, she's involved in a lot of the outreach efforts that we do. And so she'll be joining us today to share some of her experiences. So uh, just a little bit uh, about us. Um, we are from Florida State University College of Medicine, specifically from the Center for Child Stress and Health. Uh, we are a part of a network of centers from across the country known as the NCTSN or the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Uh, there are 100 plus centers across the country with each center focusing in a different area of trauma and mental health as it relates to children. So our specialty is uh, trauma or adversity as uh, impacted or experienced by children from agricultural families, migrant farm working families, or children living in rural areas. So that's kind of our, our the focus of the work that we do. We create a lot of resources to help clinicians who treat children from agricultural families. We are located in Immokalee, Florida. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, this is in Southwest Florida, a small agricultural community. Uh, we are co-located with a federally qualified health center. Uh, so we share a campus with the healthcare network uh, within our building. Uh, the healthcare network has their pediatrics department and their women's health department. And then adjacent to us is family medicine, internal medicine, specialty, and several other services that the FQHC provides. So while uh, we are a university and an academic health center, uh, our clinical work takes place at the Federally Qualified Health Center, the Healthcare Network, and we do a lot in collaboration with the Healthcare Network. So what we'll be sharing with you today is the work that we have done in collaboration with the Healthcare Network and in serving the agricultural families that receive healthcare services from the FQHC. Uh, so in case you're not familiar with the Immokalee, it is in Southwest Florida, just above the Everglades. Um, the largest crop that is produced here is tomato. So I'm going to share just a few pictures of our community with you. This is a, a picture of our, our Marqueta, where you can get all kinds of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, here's a picture of one of our outreach events, where here we have uh, medical students who are out in the fields providing health screenings. You see pictured uh, in the middle as well. Uh, promotora that was attending that event uh, as well. So we do a lot of outreach in the community, but we also uh, provide integrated healthcare services uh, within the facility. 
pictured here is a psychologist within the pediatrics department providing services to a young child. So while uh, our focus is on pediatrics, the information that we'll share today really is applicable to uh, all populations, and we'll talk about some of our efforts to reach the community in general. So specifically what, what we plan to accomplish today um, really is just to, to tell you our story of how we have gone out into the community to provide services that then will help link community members needing mental health services back to the primary care integrated care setting. So we just wanna give you some examples of some of the things that we have done in the community to promote mental health and again, to link patients back to the primary care setting where they can receive integrated behavioral health services. Um, so we'll share some examples and we'll open up for, for questions and comments. If at any point while we're sharing information, you'd like to make a comment, please feel free to um, place your comment in the chat box. And I'll also try to pause throughout the presentation if anyone would like to unmute themselves and either make a comment or ask a question. So uh, I wanna begin uh, just spending a few minutes talking about what is integrated care. Uh, there is no nationally recognized definition of integrated care. So we, we may each mean something different when we say integrated care, but I think what we can all agree on is that the term is usually used to describe efforts to provide healthcare services that bring together all of the components that makes humans healthy. So their medical healthcare is being provided in the same place and oftentimes at the same time as their mental healthcare is being provided. Now, while we can agree that that is in general what integrated care means, um, there are a few models that help us to understand what all integrated healthcare entails. Um, here on the screen, you see a, an image of a concept that we adapted from the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association that helps me to understand kind of the components of integrated care. One way to think about integrated care is to consider three aspects. So the models of integrated care clinical pathways, and then perspectives. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about each of these. So first is models. So models is the delivery strategy or the specific ways in which professionals work together to provide healthcare services. So we know in integrated care, you will typically have a primary care provider and then a mental health provider. So the model of an integrated care program outlines how does the primary care provider work together with the behavioral health provider? And there are different models for how to do that. I'll give you three examples in a moment. Then integrated care should also include clinical pathways. So clinical pathways are algorithms or a process that is used to guide care to make sure that patients with specific conditions receive monitored and timely care. So oftentimes when we think of integrated care, we simply think or imagine there's this behavioral health provider or mental health provider that's available to whomever needs it, whenever they need it. And there's some truth to that. However, within integrated care programs, there should also be these pathways, which are processes to designate when do particular patients with a particular condition, receive an intervention from a behavioral health provider. So it's a pathway or a process for specific patients to receive integrated behavioral health services. And I'll give you an example of a clinical pathway that we use in our integrated care program. And then finally, integrated care programs should have a particular perspective. So the perspective is the approach or the framework that guides the integrated care efforts. It's kind of like a theme. So an integrated care program should have a theme or a focus area that guides its efforts. So it's kind of like the roots of an integrated care program. It's what guides and feeds all of the work that happens. So I'll give you an example of what is our perspective for our program. So I mentioned I wanted to give you three examples of models for integrated care. So when we think about integrated care, 
some people use that term really to describe coordinated care. So coordinated care is when you have a primary care provider in one building that may refer a patient to a mental health provider that is located in a separate building working for a different agency. Now, those two providers may communicate with one another, so they may send report or, or share evaluation information, but they work at two different agencies. Uh, they have their own medical records, and they are simply coordinating the patient's care between those two agencies. Sometimes integrated care refers to that level of coordinated care. Then there is co-located care. So co-located care is when you have a primary care provider in one agency and then a mental health provider from another agency who comes and provides services in the building where the primary care provider is housed. They work for two different agencies but are housed in the same building. They still have a formal referral process. So if a primary care provider wants to refer a patient to behavioral health, if they are co-located, the primary care provider would still have to submit a referral. You would still have to get a release of information for permission for the two to talk to one another. Having co-located care improves access to mental health services. Being in the same building improves access, right? but that's co-located care in the sense that they work independent of each other in the same building, but communicate back and forth. Then there's this third model, which is PCBH, primary care behavioral health. With primary care behavioral health, you have this full integration of medical and behavioral health services. So both the primary care provider and the behavioral health provider work for the same agency, they share the same spaces, they document in the same medical record, they shall share the same scheduling staff, the same receptionist staff. Oftentimes they work together to come up with a treatment plan for the patient. It's a cohesive team of at least those two different disciplines, medical and behavioral health, working together. So they're fully integrated. That's the, the model that we will refer to today when we say integrated care. It's primary care behavioral health, where you have these two disciplines working together as one team. Now, so we, we know that there are these different models, right, of what integrated care is. Today, we will focus on primary care behavioral health. I mentioned that an integrated care program should have a perspective. So I want to talk a little bit about what is a perspective now and give you an example of the perspective of our integrated care program. The perspective, again, is the framework or the approach that guides and feeds all of your integrated care efforts. It's kind of like having a theme or a focus area of your integrated care program. So mental health encompasses many, many things, right? But programs usually will be rooted in a particular area of mental health. Uh, that is their perspective. So all of the services that they offer really should focus and be guided by that perspective or that focus area. For our integrated care program, we have two perspectives or two focus areas. One is ACEs or Adverse Childhood Experiences and the other is trauma-informed care. I'll talk about each of these so that you can see the, an example of how these perspectives really guide all of our integrated care efforts and what we do out in the community to link people back into the integrated care program. So first, uh, trauma-informed care. That is one of our perspectives. Uh, Trauma-informed care is a way to provide care to patients uh, by acknowledging or recognizing the impact of trauma, understanding what are the signs and symptoms of trauma, and then responding to patients in a way that is sensitive given any traumatic experiences that they may have had. Um, we serve a highly agricultural community, highly immigrant community, Many of our community members have come to the United States oftentimes to escape very difficult situations in their countries of origin. 
For some, it may be to escape uh, extreme poverty. For others, it may be to escape violence or some form of persecution. But many of the patients that we serve have experienced a, a good deal of adversity and traumatic experiences in their past. Uh, working or providing healthcare services in a trauma-informed way simply acknowledges that the patients we treat likely have gone through some traumatic experiences. And so we need to be sensitive to those experiences. We need to be sensitive so that we don't re-trigger or re-traumatize our patients. And we also need to be sensitive so that we appropriately identify what are their treatment needs. A person who has gone through a traumatic experiences or a traumatic experience may have very specific treatment needs that need to be addressed. So our perspective is to understand that our population has likely gone through some traumatic experiences and we need to be aware of that. We need to be responsive, sensitive to it and help identify those patients who have had trauma in their lives and help them to recover from that trauma. Along those lines, I mentioned that our perspective also includes ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. ACEs has to do with experiences that an adult has had during their childhood that places them at risk for particular health conditions. Uh, the, this concept of ACEs comes from a research study that took place in the late, late 1990s at Kaiser Permanente in California. The researchers of that study, what they did is they asked a group of adult, 15,000 plus adults, to say what kind of adverse or difficult traumatic experiences they had during their childhood. And then they looked to see if there was a relationship between the type of traumatic experiences and the number of traumatic experiences they had with their chronic health conditions during adulthood. So they wanted to know, for instance, does someone who has experienced sexual abuse during childhood have a higher risk of developing diabetes? Or if somebody has experienced sexual abuse and physical abuse and poverty, for example, does the fact that they have experienced these three different adverse experiences place them at a higher risk for cancer, for instance? So they were looking for these relationships and they were able to narrow it down to 10 ACE events or 10 adverse experiences that when you experience four or more of those during childhood, it increase your risk for developing chronic health conditions. So on the screen, on the left-hand side, you see those 10 original ACE events, and they are divided into three different categories. So there is abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. So what we learned from that study is that these are common adverse events for some traumatic events that um, impact a person's health. I gave an example a moment ago, a, an individual who has experienced sexual abuse, for example, has a significant higher risk of developing diabetes during adulthood. So we should do a, a better job at identifying which of our patients have had some of these traumatic experiences so that we can prevent uh, some of these medical conditions that we know they are at risk for. Um, in addition to those 10 ACE events that were identified in the late 1990s, we also know that our population faces other unique stressors such as deportation fears, um, family separations, or even just the risk of family separations for our migrant families, the transient lifestyle, having to constantly be relocating, that's a significant adversity, discrimination, um, inadequate housing. Uh, all of these are stressors that impact their health, their well-being, and their quality of life. And so our integrated care program has this as a focus or a perspective what we look to do is identify patients who are particularly impacted by trauma and by these adversities. We look to inform the community about the relationship of these adversities with health and show them where to seek help, link them back to our integrated care program. So that is our perspective, right? That's what guides our integrated care program. And integrated care programs are encouraged to select a perspective I gave you two examples of our focus areas, but there are many other models 
um, that are out there and other focus areas that a program can choose. So now I wanna talk to you about uh, clinical pathways. So clinical pathways, again, are algorithms or a process that is used to guide care to make sure that patients with specific conditions receive timely care. So an integrated care program should have these pathways or these guides, these processes in place to make sure that people who are impacted by their perspective or their area of focus receive the care that they need, receive the integrated care they need. So our perspective I mentioned is individuals who are impacted by traumatic experiences or by adverse experiences, things like child abuse, uh, divorce, separation, that is our perspective, right? So we want to make sure that we have a clinical pathway or a process for our patients who are impacted by these types of traumas and adversities to receive integrated care. We don't wanna leave it up to chance. We wanna make sure that people have a process, a pathway to receive care. So this is what our pathway looks like. We um, provide computerized trauma screenings when a family comes to receive services at our facility. So we would screen the family for trauma. For all of the ACEs that I mentioned earlier, we would ask questions to see which of those traumatic or adverse experiences they have gone through. And we do that through a computerized screening process that we have developed here. So a family will go to a kiosk, it's a touchscreen device where they would answer a set of questions. Uh, we have that screening available in Spanish and English and in Creole. And we also have a version for non-readers. So we use audio prompts and different visual images or visual aids to help those who are unable to read to provide responses. So our process or a clinical pathway begins with this computerized screening that identifies individuals who have gone through these traumatic experiences. So when they come into the clinic in the waiting room, they will answer these questions in the kiosk. The kiosk will score their responses, will generate a report. Once the patient is called back for their appointment, the nurse during the vitals, while they're taking the patient's blood pressure, high weight, what the nurse will do is will review critical items that are endorsed or that we screen for. So if, if a patient endorses uh, that they've been sexually abused or if a patient endorses that they're currently having suicidal ideation, that's part of our screening as well is to ask about depression symptoms. The nurse will alert the behavioral health provider. So we'll let the behavioral health provider know that someone has screened positive for trauma or for ACEs. That behavioral health provider will then review the results, will go into the exam room. So we'll do a consultation with the patient. Now remember the patient didn't come in for a trauma screening. The patient came in for their medical office visit. Typically their annual physical exam is when we do these screenings. So the patient came in to see their physician for their annual physical exam. But before they see their physician, we do these screenings, right? Because we wanna identify patients impacted by trauma. Um, once they are in an exam room, if we have a positive screen for trauma, then the psychologist would go into that exam room, usually ahead or before the physician or the primary care provider would review those screening results with the family and will identify if there are any risk and needs for treatment. The, the behavioral health provider next would consult with the physician uh, come up with a list of needs, some ideas for treatment plans. The physician will then go in and do their well visit or their annual physical exam. And then after the physical exam, we would determine how do we need to respond to any traumatic events that we have identified. In some cases, it may be guidance from the primary care provider. In other cases, it may be a, the behavioral health provider would begin to provide treatment to help that person recover from their traumatic experiences. So the point I wanna make here is that there are these clinical pathways that are an important part of the integrated care program where we have designated points in the patient's care where behavioral health would come in automatically if it's been identified that they could have a need for behavioral health services. And again, this is guided by your perspective, the perspective or the framework of your program. In our case, it's trauma and ACEs. So um, 
I, I want to pause for a second and see if, if there are any questions. What I'm going to do next is talk a little bit about where do promotores and community health workers fit in, in into this model. But if there are any questions um, that anyone wants to ask, I'll pause here. I see some in the chat box. Um, someone is asking, are there any validated survey tools which evaluate program impact on isolation and connection experience by children? Uh, we run a summer program for children far of farm workers and believe that the connection is important, but have not known how to measure impact. Um, okay, so there, you're asking, are there any tools to measure the impact on isolation? Um, I, I don't know of a specific measure to see what's the impact of isolation, but I can comment on the measures that we use to measure the impact of trauma in general and the impact of ACEs. Um, we use the pediatric symptom checklist, uh, which there are different versions of it. There's an abbreviated 17 item version, and then there's a longer 35 item version. Uh, the pediatric symptom checklist will screen for typical symptoms that are associated with behavioral or social emotional problems. So it helps detect for symptoms of like depression, anxiety, or social problems. Um, we have found that to be an effective tool to use in a primary care setting to identify if there are symptoms associated with the traumatic experiences that a child has gone through. And it also is a really good measure of improvement of symptoms. So once we begin to offer treatment, is the patient getting better? Yeah, so there's a question in addition to the trauma, how does the center deal with lack of insurance, transportation needs, language, culture barriers, and other social needs of the client? Yeah, great question. Um, so remember that we, we do this in the context of a federally qualified health center. So there are some services that are provided to help with transportation through the federally qualified health center. Um, insurance it, it is treated just like in most community health centers where there is a sliding fee scale if somebody is uninsured. Um, we have the benefit of this partnership between the federally qualified health center and uh, the Florida State University College of Medicine. We are a training site which means that we do have trainees that rotate through the FQHC, including psychologists in training. Uh, for those psychologists that are in training, there is no fee for the behavioral health services that they provide. And so that is a great collaboration because it allows us to train new professionals that will hopefully stay and work in areas like ours. But it also gives us an opportunity to offer in high, high quality services to patients with, without a fee. So that partnership between the university and the Federal Qualified Health Center um, really helps. Uh, and then the social needs of the clients, that's a great question. And I, I, I'm going to hold off on the answer to that because I think you will see in a moment how we respond to some of the social needs. And oftentimes, social needs do arise through the screening process. It's not just the mental health need that we identify. We do oftentimes come across social needs, and we'll show you how we respond to some of those. So uh, we're, we're building kind of this framework of what integrated care looks like. There are these pathways or processes to designate, you know, when and who gets these integrated care services. But, you know, where do I fit in? If, I, if I'm a community health worker, if, if I'm a promotora, where do I fit into this integrated care process? So what, what we want to do next is look at some of the most common job components or competencies of promotores and community health workers and show you how in our setting these job components or competencies have been used to tie back into the integrated care setting. So as community health workers and promotores, um, you're good at interpreting you explain medical information that is important to well-being of people. Uh, you educate individuals, the community, about issues that impact their health. You inform the community about services that are available. You advocate for services that are needed in the community. You provide outreach. You organize. You find and link individuals to services that are needed in the community. These are things that you already do in your job. What we want to do now is give you some examples of how you can use some of your competencies and your skills to link 
people back to the integrated care setting. So one example is to advocate. Um, so you, you have received now a, an example of what an integrated care program could look like, a model for that. Um, one thing that in, in my experience in talking to different integrated care programs, one thing that is sometimes uh, missing is that clinical pathway that I mentioned. So part of integrated care should include a clinical pathway that designates when particular patients should receive integrated care services. So again, in our case is patients impacted by trauma. Um, if you work within an integrated care setting that doesn't have these pathways in place, one thing that you could do is advocate for that. In our case, it was advocating that we include these trauma screenings. Why? Because we know that migrant agricultural workers have an increase in the incidence of mental disorders, including things like anxiety and trauma, that's related to a series of social environmental variables that includes things like low socioeconomic status or low social status, discrimination, and separation from families. We know that our community is impacted by, by those factors, so why are we not doing something about it? We have to address that when they come to our health center. So one thing that you could do is to advocate for your health center to have that sort of clinical pathway. So here's the clinical pathway that I mentioned in a moment. This is the pathway that we have in place. So part of your advocacy could be to have these clinical pathways in place, but what you can also do is become a part of this clinical pathway. I'll show you an example of how that has happened in, in our setting. So we provide these trauma screenings, right? But before we provide these trauma screenings, we have the opportunity to go out into the community and inform the community that this is happening. So if your integrated care program has a particular perspective, let's say, for example, your community health center decides we're going to start doing these trauma screenings. As a community health worker, you could go out into the community and inform the community that this is happening, that this is taking place so that they will be more likely to come and get services and so that they are prepared, they can anticipate that when they come to the community health center, they're going to be asked these questions. When they come to the community health center, they may talk to a behavioral health provider. If the community is informed of the services that are provided and what's going to happen when they're in the clinic, so if the, if the community knows what this clinical pathway looks like, they're more likely to participate, more likely to come, more likely to feel comfortable, more likely to understand why this is being done. In our case, we do ask some sensitive questions about trauma. And so if we go out and inform the community that we're doing this, the community comes prepared. They know we're going to ask some sensitive questions and they know why we're going to do that. And it really helps this clinical process or pathway to, to flow a lot smoother. So that's one place where you can integrate yourself is by informing the community. But what we have also done is we have added um, a pathway to provide help whenever there is a need, especially a social need as a result of these screenings. So we use a, an electronic medical record um, we take advantage of the electronic medical record to link families with community health worker services, outreach services. So for instance, if, if me as a behavioral health provider, I work with a family and identify that yes, they've been impacted by trauma, they may need mental health services, but they don't just need the mental health services that I could provide, they need a variety of other services. I use my medical record to then link that family to Kathy. So I will submit um, what we call an order in our medical record with a note about my concerns about the family and how I think community health worker services would benefit that family. And that order or that note electronically goes to Kathy in the electronic medical record. And so during certain times of the day, Kathy will go into the electronic medical record and she'll access my note and then follow up with, with families accordingly. So we do that electronically through the medical record. Kathy has access to the information that she needs to be able to do her work. And in addition to doing it through the medical record, sometimes I just walk the patient over to, to Kathy's office and introduce the patient to Kathy 
and it's kind of a warm handoff to Kathy, and then Kathy will continue doing her work. Um, but uh, I think the, the key point that I want to share here is this integration of the community health worker to the clinical pathways. There are different ways in which you can integrate the community health worker, but this is how we have done it in our setting. At the very beginning of this pathway is informing the community about our program and about our screenings. And then after the screening is completed, when a need is identified, there is a way to link that patient to Kathy so that she can um, follow up with the family and provide additional services. So I'll let Kathy step in here and, and share you know, her role in this pathway. Yes, and I think um, aside from the obvious of, of linking families to the needed resource, whether it's employment, whether it's housing, whether it's um, special needs in, in school, um, food, basic needs, um, is that element that um, oftentimes, you know, the providers are under a time crunch. Their appointments have a, a time limit. So especially when, as Dr. Rosado said, you know, the patients are here at the clinic and um, I can see them before they leave. So it's a very privileged time to be able to sit down, take time, talk, have a conversation, and um, right there begin the process. And oftentimes, you know, all that is is just a little moral support, making a phone call. They don't feel comfortable making a phone call or they don't know how. Um, so being able to accompany them, it's accompaniment, in my opinion, the whole way. Um, that's, that's how I see it. Um, you know, I'm providing, you're providing uh, links to resources, but in reality, oftentimes, I think, <laughs> in the parents' eyes, um, we become a resource for the parent, uh, and hopefully a trusted resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when, when we were preparing for this presentation and, and Kathy was describing, you know, what she does, the, the word she came up with was a company. Um, and that's where we put it up on the screen because it really describes part of her work is accompanying the patient, sometimes through this process, right? Because at the beginning, we would have informed the patient. And so they know, hey, this is happening. And then they would see her again at the end after the screening, where they may need that link to other supports and other services. And, and you know, Kathy, Kathy's role in this pathway is so valuable particularly because of the restraints that she mentioned. So, you know, as you know, our community health centers sometimes are overwhelmed. There are a lot of patients, you know, providers don't have a lot of extra time. And so the, the time they spent with the patient is limited. And it's, it's so wonderful to be able to have that warm handoff to Kathy. And sometimes I will say to Kathy, you know, Kathy, this is the need. Um, this mama needs to be linked with this particular type of resource, whether it may be you know, housing or legal assistance or food. But a lot of times I'll say, Kathy, you know, they really just need someone. Can, can you just be your caring self with them? They, you know, they just disclosed some of these traumatic experiences. We responded clinically, but we want them to leave here knowing that they're a company, right? That they're not alone in this process and that they're not alone in whatever recovery they need to go through based on their traumatic experiences. So, and again, it's all yeah. about relationships too, you know, the relationship piece. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes these cases are ongoing. Uh, I spoke with somebody this morning who we started in October and, you know, he, he asked me for help, you know, about connecting with a doctor about some medical help for his son. So, you know, it's not just goodbye, it's ongoing. And it's, like I said, relationship, relating. Exactly. Yeah, that, I think that's key is to be able to accompany the patient and you do that through the relationship that you establish with them. 
So I want to give you some other examples of things that we have done, again, to link the community and patients back to the integrated care services and how to respond to any needs that have been identified. Uh, one of the things that we have done is we have created a community resource guide um, that provides all of the community resources that we could potentially link patients back to. So we're doing these trauma screenings. We're identifying social, behavioral, medical needs. If we're going to ask about their needs, we need to be able to respond to their needs. And one way that we have done that is by putting together a community resource directly. Initially, we started the, the resource directly ourselves. It's something that we put together, but eventually it evolved to be in a collaborative effort of several different agencies in the community. So as you could see, here's the, the cover page, uh, which is titled Immokalee Unmet Needs Coalition. So there was a coalition um, of community agencies that eventually came together and now keeps this community resource directly going. So we're no longer in charge of it. We started it and now it has evolved into a, a greater community resource kit. So what else can community health workers or promotores do to, again, link patients back to the integrated care setting? One, one way is to designate or disseminate information or health information that impacts the, the community. Here I give some example about COVID-19 and how it was so important to know what was happening in the community. In our setting, a lot of times what happens is the, the providers, so the physicians, oftentimes do not live in the community. They work in the community, but they commute. So they're not always fully aware of everything that's going on in the community, or it takes a little bit of time. There's some lag time before the providers find out what are the needs or what's recent or happening in the community. And so community health workers um, and promotores know the community really well and can inform the primary care providers and behavioral health providers of what are the needs in the community. So for instance, um, for us during COVID, there were a lot of myths that were going on about the virus. One myth in particular was that um, these testing events were, were being taking place at different parts of the community. And there was this myth that when you went to get tested, you were actually being infested with the virus. So you, you were getting the virus when you went for testing. That was a rumor that was going on in the community. And so it, it was great to have someone in the community that's familiar with the community come back to the primary care team and inform them that this was happening so some of those myths could be addressed. And so it, in, in our case, what we did is came up with a media campaign that included some brief videos and some uh, flyers, handouts that we created. You see a couple of those um, displayed on, on the screen, but informing, informing not just the community, but informing the primary care team. Usually we think of promotores and community health workers informing the community, but it could work the other way around. It's informing the primary care team of what's going on in the community. Um, another example of uh, our work in the community has been to bolster the community. That means providing support to community members. Remember that the theme or the perspective of our program is trauma and adversity. And so that's what guides our outreach efforts. And that's what guides us linking people back to the community. So here's an example of another event uh, that we did to address the community needs. Um, this was a grief camp that took place and I'll let Kathy step in and, and describe what that event was like. Yes, yeah, so one of the resources um, that I use is an agency or uh, it's a vow. They're, um, they work with grieving. I use them a lot, especially with the, ch the, ch the children, but they work with families who have experienced loss of a loved one. And um, actually, we partnered with Avow, and um, we had on Saturday, some Saturday mornings, a couple times a year, they um, would come out. We would invite our families that we knew who have had experienced uh, recently or in the past year the loss of a loved one. 
And so the families came together and it really was an opportunity to um, share at another level with these families um, at a very vulnerable time for them. And um, the beauty was the parents and the, and the children sharing their experience of loss together. And for some of them, for the first time, expressing these feelings and having feelings being validated, um, not only you know, by the team from a vow and the staff, but also from other family members and other participant, participants. So you had families there also sharing together their experience with other families, that sense of solidarity and, and pain and suffering, um, sharing losses and grief together. And it was also fun. Um, there was crafts and singing and activities. Um, the, the children had a chance to um, make something uh, related, you know, to the theme and also related to the memory of the loved one who had passed on. So it was, um, oh, it was just a beautiful time together for families and uh for staff, I think, you know, we all benefited. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. So again, that, that's an example, right, of how we collaborated with other agencies to address some of these mental health needs that fall within the perspective of our program. And so this was a really good opportunity. It was a weekend event, a grief camp, where um, families were able to receive support, but also they were linked into our integrated health and behavioral health program. So if there were needs that were identified that needed ongoing care, there was that link back to integrated care program. But the way that the families were attracted, right, and became aware of the integrated care program was through this grief camp event. Um, next, I wanna share um, how we have uh, attempted to improve our communication with the community about mental health concepts so as community health workers, um, things that are done is interpret and explain concepts, especially difficult concepts related to behavioral health or health. So we have found it really helpful to use analogies to explain health concepts. So we have two analogies that we use when we're introducing the idea of getting integrated behavioral health services. We know that there's a lot of stigma, right, about going to see a mental health professional. And so it helps to explain what is mental health and why mental health is important. So one analogy that we use is this tree analogy. And what we explain is that um, a, a child's development is very similar to the development of a tree. So in order to have a healthy tree, like the one you see pictured on the left, you need the correct environment. So you need the right amount of sunlight, the right amount of uh, rain. Uh, you need to make sure that there aren't winds that are too strong that the root of the tree can't hold up. The environment is really important. If the environment isn't correct, if this tree doesn't have the right support, the right amount of water, the right amount of sunlight, it's not going to grow, it's not gonna flourish. It'll look more like the tree on the right-hand side. And so what are the supports that a tree needs? Water, sunlight. What are the supports that we need as human beings? Well, sometimes we need a friend Sometimes we need a medical provider. Sometimes we need medicine. Sometimes we need a behavioral health provider. So a behavioral health provider is just one more thing, right? That's gonna help us flourish and be healthy. Just like a tree needs water every once in a while, we also need to talk to someone. So that's one analogy that we use. Um, we also borrow this analogy from one of our colleagues at the NCTSN of a beach ball. This works well for us because we're, we're in Florida and so everybody goes to the beach here. Uh, but when we, we use this beach ball to talk about uh, what we name resilience, uh, resilience is the ability of someone to bounce back or to recover from an adverse event. So if you see this ball on the left, it's flat, right? There's no air. If you look at the ball on the right, it has enough air, enough air that allows the ball to bounce, right? And so we explain that sometimes in life, we go through these adversities that flatten us, right? That take kind of the energy out of us, traumatic experiences. Remember, our emphasis is trauma. Sometimes we go through these adversities that 
flatten our ball or attempt to flatten our resilience. And we need these puffs of air to fill our ball back up so that we could bounce back from some of our adver adversities. So then we talk about what are these puffs of air? Again, is it talking to a friend? Is it going to the priest at your local church and asking for support? Is it talking to your medical provider? Is it talking to a behavioral health provider? These are puffs of air that can help you bounce back um, and recover from your adversity. So we, we have found that analogy to be helpful. We've also found it very helpful um, to talk about the integration of physical and emotional health. Those two things are oftentimes treated very separately, right? So we, we've created some images and some materials to help people see the similarities between physical health and emotional health. We, we focus a lot on the differences between the two, and that's why there's some stigma, but there are a lot more similarities between our physical health and our mental or emotional health. Here's one example. So if we're injured physically, it hurts. It takes time to get better. You need professional help. If we are injured emotionally or something's going on with our mental health, it hurts. It also takes time to get better. I also need professional help. So again, we're looking for the similarities. People are much more likely to get medical help after an injury, much less likely to get mental health after an adverse event. And so these are the ways that we try to communicate with individuals about the importance of integrative care. And then now with telehealth, um, this has been kind of a, a new area that COVID has kind of uh, pushed us into. I know somebody asked in the comment box if we've seen that children have been impacted by mental health during COVID, and the answer is yes. Um, how we have responded in part is by providing more telepsychology services. We've remained open during the pandemic, so we have continued to provide in-person mental health visits, but we've also provided telehealth appointments. And so um, if your center is providing this service, this may be another opportunity for you to get involved. Kathy has certainly spent a portion of her time during the pandemic helping to link families with telepsychology. So I know we're running out of time, but I'll let her comment, um, take a minute to comment about her experiences helping link families with telepsychology. Right. Um, yeah, it was um, one of the hardest parts for me is was that, you know, with telepsychology, there's no personal contact. So I, I didn't know the families. I, I didn't know the kids. But the big part, for, the big frustration for me um, was trying to help them because of what I would call like a technology language barrier. Um, many of these, many of the families have never had a, a tablet or a computer in front of them. So trying to explain um, a virtual appointment um, was for some of them just out of their reality. Um, you know, they would ask me if I was going to go to their house or if somebody was going to pick them up, it was hard for them to grasp. So the vocabulary, just the words like internet, link, click, click on, you know, password. Um, it was just, it was just uh, very different for them. And some of them, because of the, in dealing with them, I sensed for some of them, it was just not only frustrating for me um, that because I couldn't help them the way I wanted to, but um, the frustration on their part, but the, also the perseverance, perseverance. Um, you know, a lot of callbacks, um, trying to figure out creative ways, like, is there a neighbor next door that, you know, could be with you as I explain and, you know, so that, you know, the link is that little blue thing that's underlined, things like, things like that. So, um, but also the fact that, you know, you, you have to accept that sometimes you can't connect with everybody. And sometimes it was better just to kind of back off and try to figure out another way because you just sense the, frustration level was um, 
a little bit much, but many of them persevered and it got easier and it worked. Yeah. Yeah. I think we go back to that, a company, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some families could be intimidating and overwhelming this whole concept of telehealth or telepsychology, but mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to accompany patients. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll wrap up with in the next minute uh, or so to show you just a few more examples of things that we have done in the community, again, to link the community back to integrated care services. One is to go out into the community and do educational sessions around, again, our area of perspective, which is trauma and adverse experiences. Here are some pictures of us um, speaking to two different groups. Both of them are parents from migrant education programs. We would go into after school meetings and share information about trauma, toxic stress, and again, explain the screening process that would take place uh, when they come to the community health center. Um, we've also partnered with a local school um, who was hosting these family literacy events. Um, our collaboration with the school really came as a result of conversations, discussions about the needs of the school and the mental health needs of the families. Um, so we would go out to events that the school had and we would facilitate parent groups around trauma, adverse childhood experiences. We would again explain the screening process at the clinic. So do some parent education and then also do activities with children. As you could see here, Kathy pictured with a young child doing an activity. These were weekend events on a Saturday. Each event had a different theme to it. So for instance, one weekend, the theme was affect expression, which means, you know, learning to identify and express emotion. So we had activities around identifying different emotions and then a parent group around how do you talk to children about emotions. So this was a, a, a place for us to partner again with the community. Another event that we have done is a community baby shower. This has been done in collaboration with other agencies. This is probably one of the, the more fun rewarding events that we have done. This has been an event to educate expecting moms about postpartum depression and to link them with services, including integrated care services. Um, this is for expecting moms. That it is actually a baby shower for many of our participating moms. This was their baby shower. Uh, they would come and receive gifts that were donated by different community agencies. And during the baby shower, in addition to doing the fun games and food, uh, we would also do educational topics. So there was a mental health provider who came in and talked about postpartum depression and then other um, presentations about safety related to, to infants. Um, and then I'll share one more example. Um, we participate in an open streets activity to promote wellness. One way that we promote integrated care is by combining overall wellness with behavioral health this is a monthly event that typically takes place in our community where people come out and exercise together. As you can see, there's a Zumba class there. There are different booths that are set up from community agencies. So we will have a mental health booth at this event. We will also provide a fun activity. So sometimes we may be the ones to host the Zumba. Other times we may bring in a fun game that we do. But the purpose of the activity is for people to have a healthy place to um, do exercise, to get information about their health, mental health, well-being. There's a food bank. Um, there is fun activities for kids. But this is an opportunity for us to get out there, to know the community, to link with patients that would eventually come to the clinic and to emphasize this theme of wellness and that mental health is part of your wellness. And it's okay to talk about your mental health. So in, in summary, you know, I, I want to, again, emphasize that integrated care programs um, are going to be most effective if they have this perspective. So a framework that guides their work. It's important to have pathways that link particular patients with integrated care services. And there are opportunities for community health workers to be part of that pathway and to link patients to that pathway to make sure that those in most need are getting the integrated care services. Um, I saw that Gladys posted our, our website on the chat box. It is fsustress.org. We have a variety of resources on our website. The majority of them are in Spanish, English, and Creole. So we invite you to visit our homepage and, and download and utilize any of the materials that you see are helpful. 
Um, here's our contact information if you would like to follow up with us um, at a later time with, with more questions or if you need some other resources on our website and, and want to discuss those with us, you can contact us um, at this email address or phone number. Um, and I know we're just about out of time. Um, but yes, thank you, Ros Dr. Rosado. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's session. Um, we will be staying for a couple more minutes to address a few of the questions in the chat box. I just want to remind everyone of the survey link that was already posted. If you can, please complete it so that we have your feedback. But um, Dr. Rosado, we had a few questions come in. I think you already addressed one in terms of COVID, but there was a question about um, uh, differences in sexual health conditions and risks of ag workers and the way you provide mental health treatment to improve their sexual health in terms of prevention and treatment. Yeah, so uh, oftentimes when there are concerns related to sexual health, and re remember I, I work within the pediatrics department, so I'll comment on what we do. Those issues we screen for during physical exams or during well visits, um, that's part of our screening process. And so when a need arises, the behavioral health provider will go into that office visit, that exam room, and then we'll work to address those issues. Um, in pediatrics, it's normally during adolescence where some of those issues come up. And so we look for opportunities to provide the adolescent with support um, and, and try to give them some privacy, obviously, with their parents. Sometimes it's hard to discuss some of those issues. So we make it a point to give the adolescent some one-on-one -on -one time with their healthcare provider to address those issues. Um, I mentioned that we have partnerships with the schools. Uh, one way that we address some of those issues is at different points during the school year, we have had groups uh, within the after-school programs where some of those issues are, are also addressed. Thank you. We also had a question about cultural competency training. Um, or any awareness that you have found that works well to address farm worker mental health needs? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. So before we implemented the clinical pathway that I showed you, so the pathway where we screen patients for these adversities, before we started that, uh, we did a training of the entire healthcare team, everybody. That's everyone from the receptionist, you know, who greet the patient when they come in to the person who answers the phone to schedule the appointment, the nurses, the primary care providers, physicians, the behavioral health providers, everyone who makes contact with a patient was trained. And in our case, was trained on how to be trauma informed, how to be aware of what is trauma how trauma impacts people, what are the specific traumatic events that agricultural workers are exposed to, why we're screening for trauma, how we treat it when we identify it. And that was really, really important, especially to get buy-in um, from the staff. This does take some time, obviously, to, to do go through the screening process and everyone plays a role in that process. So we did, um, before we even started any of this, went through a series of training sessions uh, prior to implementing. And then after we implemented, we also took time out to follow up once we started screening and, and give more education and support to the staff. Great, thank you, Dr. Rosado. Um, I think we've addressed all the questions and just wanna encourage you to read all the uh, wonderful comments you've received in the chat. Um, Thanking you for your work um, and for you and Kathy's dedication. Very informative presentation. Um, thank you all for doing this. And we thank everyone for joining us this morning in today's presentation. We hope you enjoyed the rest of the virtual stream forum. Thank you. Thank you.